take it Great forward. having me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jan Christoph. So it's a lot happening in, in Gothenburg indeed. Uh, um, and Volvo is just one of our many partners in both research and education here, together with uh, Jutteborg University. Um, we recently also um, celebrated 400 years of the city of Gothenburg, so there's indeed quite a lot of things uh, going on. Um, so in the following 20 minutes, I would like to talk you through um, some uh, research and development work that I've been doing in the past, uh, I would say, 10 to 15 years, uh, while being a part of, of the higher educational system that we know is uh, getting under pressure uh, more and more due to different factors driving change both in technology, in society and all around the topic of learning. So I will talk you through um, the following topics here. Um, the first one being the VUCA world of education. Then I'll ask the question, what's so humanizing about design and try to dive into three very simplified scenarios. And uh, last but not least, I will also dive into the question why design might not even be enough to face all of these complex challenges around our educational system. Um, so what's so VUCA about uh, the educational landscape? And VUCA, as you know, uh, refers to volatility, uncertainty, complexity and ambiguity. Um, as it has been, uh, or this is a graph that I've been uh, using as an introduction to a keynote in 2018 uh, in Portugal, and basically it's it's showing the observation that while most of our um, educational learning paths uh, were targeting one professional career in the past, uh, we are nowadays aware that it's about multiple professional careers. It's becoming more and more about themes and complex challenges, the sustainable development goals being some of them, for example. But more and more, we're also uh, heading towards a world where the essential or existential meaning of work, so also kind of the, let's say, the, the one of the main objectives of uh, education is being heavily questioned. And it's been said in the introduction uh, of uh, this session today that uh, more and more we're dealing with uh, jobs that uh, are not around yet or the, clear, the clarity of job profiles is decreasing while er everything around uh, is becoming more complex. And um, we saw some, some of the numbers that are being also confirmed by many reports such as the World Economic Forum and that is publishing uh, the jobs of tomorrow or jobs of the future reports on a regular base. And uh, they confirm it's hard to est estimate what sort of job profiles, what sort of competences are needed in the near future. Uh, so basically, when I think of my own education in uh, interior architecture, architecture, urban planning, um, around, I would say, in the late 90s and in the before we, uh, we moved on to the Bolognese system in, in Europe, um, it was pretty normal that you would study 14 to 20 semesters. So you would actually study 10 years, right? And, but at the same time, that knowledge and competences that you gathered in those 10 years would have a lifespan of, I would say, 20 to 30, in some cases, even to 40 years, or at least it was meant to. Now, we all know that it's it's not the same anymore, especially when we introduce the three plus, uh, plus two studies. Uh, we have more and more people transitioning into the world uh, job world just after um, uh, finishing their bachelor degree. We have more and more um, part-time studies, or I've read about um, 30 plus programs recently. So people coming back from the from the job world and, and updating uh, their skills and knowledge. So more and more we, we are developing towards lifelong learning strategies. And what that means at the same time is that while I would say um, until the beginning of the introduction of bachelor and master in, in Europe, uh, the idea was to provide people rather linear learning paths uh, with regards to the discipline. So they would, someone, well, let's say, studying architecture in a, in a first degree, had the opportunity to deepen that knowledge and, and top up his studies or her studies uh, with a master's degree. Uh, we all aware that uh, it's it's less and less learners, learners staying on those disciplinary track. So more learners are actually leaving the silos. And one observation is, for instance, mm, 
uh, at our master's programs, both here in, uh, in Gothenburg, but also in many other countries, um, more and more people join MA programs without having the same discipline as a background, both professional or bachelor's degree. For instance, people from business administration coming into design or other fields coming into design as well. So in a big picture, we are really, really about to leave linear learning paths and the viability of educational silos and, and we're entering non-linear in educational networks. And that, of course, comes with quite some challenges. And symptoms that we can observe today is, think about the job titles and degrees that are being invented all the time. Um, uh, think about uh, middle-aged learners joining MA programs while coming from other disciplines, as I, as I mentioned just. Um, learners wanting to specialize are more and more struggling because some of the programs uh, do not build upon, let's say, the basic knowledge that has been developed in a bachelor's program, but, but kind of de develop and extend in, into, into broader fields. Uh, at the same time, teaching staff and institutions having a hard time to adapt or to adopt to that new kind of flexibility that is um, requested by some of our uh, today's learners. We have more and more private offers or private players that are extending the, the, the educational landscape. And we also have something that I would um, uh, I would um, say is, is a sort of edu washing. Um, just in these days, I've been approached by a company uh, who kind of is selling itself as being the facilitator between companies, universities, the public sector. Um, and basically what they do is um, they ask a lot of money, <laughs> of course, from, uh, from all the players involved. But the core people uh, or some of the core players within these uh, collaborations who are the students who might be researchers, uh, they just being kind of soaked off the, the, the academic sphere, right? So they don't receive any additional money or resources. And, and at the same time, those participating in those educational collaborations, they kind of, you know, pride themselves on um, engaging in, in the educational sector as well. Um, so one might ask, what have the schools and universities been doing all that time that this that this change is going on? And um, I must say, um, I just when I finished my bachelor's degree, or at the time my diploma, I just had the chance to enter the new um, uh, one of the first master studies or programs in in interior architecture. And since then, uh, I think I, I haven't seen any institutions that haven't been struggling implementing the Bolognese system, struggling to introduce new public management in higher education. And at the same time, I must say many, many of these institutions also uh, de are detaching more and more from the real world or from the non-academic world. And mean meanwhile, as I said, uh, other players are pushing in. This is a screenshot from um, a keynote presentation that Karl, Vred Karl Vredenberg from IBM held at the uh, Valencia Design Educational Forum in 2020. And it shows up the roadmap or timeline uh, of IBM uh, yeah, shifting their key or some of their core businesses from top products towards academia and edu education. And they do so for good, good reasons. Uh, an internal study at um, uh, at IBM showed um, that there's quite a huge uh, or a wide range of uh, skill gaps that can be um, discovered or can be observed when the, um, when people enter the company or, um, or this multinational company. And one of them uh, with 38%, the, the major one is re really multidisciplinarity and collaboration. So that's the reason why IBM set up an own um, educate, uh, educational program to um, to fill these gaps. So wrapping up some of the challenges, um, we've seen that we, we are shifting from linear to nonlinear and lifelong learning. Um, the slow process of introducing new public management versus a high speed evolution that is needed in education causes some quite a lot of friction. Um, we have disciplinary and in institutional silos that are still dominating the educational landscape, especially when it comes to higher education. And we have an extending educational market that uh, is not only, uh, let's say, uh, which base is not only the public sector anymore, but more and more also the private one. Um, so what is so humanizing or could be so humanizing about design in that context? Um, and I think one of the superpowers and 
a good friend and, and colleague of mine, service designer Andy Pauline, once said um, the superpower that we hold as designers, and he was referring to service designers um, at the panel discussion, uh, is that we, we are meeting uh, the uncertain with a certain uh, attitude, with a certain attitude of uh, critical thinking and stating hypotheses that we then are able to turn into functional prototypes of what could be potential or hypothetical future. So that was one thing that could uh, serve to humanize this, this kind of uh, complex uh, context of education uh, again. Um, and we do so usually with a human and planet-centered approach. We are very good at combining hard with soft facts, and that is something that other disciplines are enormously struggling with, right? Especially when it comes to engineering, technology, and so on. Um, and what we also start doing better and better is that uh, while having um, evidence-based approaches, we are able both to relate to existing evidence, but also create new evidence that then can be developed further. Um, also, um, our constant process of contextualizing knowledge and skills. Um, think of the different projects that you might have conducted as a design professional. I guess none of them was identical or the same. So each and every time we work in a new context, we become learners again and we try to adopt. So we are pretty much natural lifelong learners. And this is something we can feed into the development of the educational system as well. And also from a pedagogical point of view, design is rather an interesting discipline. So this is uh, an ugly diagram, <laughs> I admit. Uh, it's also half Swedish because oh, no, it's, I know it's, I actually picked the, the English version here. So, um, but this is uh, the Bloom's taxonomy that is widely used in pedagogy. And uh, I guess most of the people who once had to do like a pedagogical certificate or something are familiar with this. And this is widely being used in education. Uh, and basically uh, splitting the ways of engaging with knowledge and skills into this pyramid that at the top uh, ends up with creating and generating new uh, new knowledge and skills. And something that I see that design even kind of adds to this pyramid is uh, foreseeing things or stating hypotheses, uh, which is rarely being reflected in, in uh, or not reflected enough in Bloom's taxonomy. So what I'm doing currently is developing a Bloom's plus canvas we're at the intersection of creation and um, and foreseeing or strategic foresight. Uh, I see quite a, a hot spot of, or let's say, um, design's biggest contribution in pedagogy, for instance. So um, three very simplified scenarios, because um, I think you could compare the, the higher educational system or the education system to the healthcare system. It's highly complex. It's highly uh, hierarchical. It is pretty much the opposite or uh, pretty much at the opposite of uh, open towards uh, uh, change. So these three scenarios are really very simplified. They show up possibilities, but I don't think they will be enough. Uh, so one thing is, um, you know, teaching design and critical thinking at kindergarten level and it's actually already um, already happening in many or some places where, you know, it helps learners to deal with the unknown uh, it helps learners to act within high levels of the Bloom's Pyramid that we saw before. And it also helps learners in gaining agency in the learning process due to that kind of ongoing process of adopting and contextualizing knowledge and skills. Um, I see um, the potential of design engaging more and more with uh, learning institutions and turning them into self-learning institutions by giving uh, more agency to the learners. So that would mainly mean moving away from static to dynamic learning goals that are still very dominating the educational landscape when it comes to creating new courses and, and, and programs, and uh, especially learning, school, learning, learning goals that relate to real world issues and learners' demands. Um, it's a lot about rethinking our pedagogy. It's also about embracing issue-based, nonlinear and iterative learning uh, by leaving the silos that are still very non-dominant. And um, most importantly, it's also stopping to trying to quantify the learning process and think rather in qualitative terms. Um, and the third one is natural lifelong learning through design. And as I said, 
We are somehow life, natural lifelong learners and developing pedagogical approaches within the latitude of creation and strategic foresight could be one approach towards this. Embracing the vuca of the educational or of our future learning path uh, by strategies of design um, considering hypothetical futures as valuable for prototypes of the actual future. Um, it's sometimes hard to imagine, but working within higher education and trying to make prototypes right, of, of what could be a potential future learning scenario is sometimes like uh, saying to a surgeon, uh, or could we prototype a new way of a heart surgery uh, on a live patient, right? That's not going to happen very easily. And the same is if you uh, sometimes, you know, uh, uh, making that same statement in higher education, trying to um, try out something new on live learners, right? And last but not least, harnessing the transformative power of design also appears very important uh, to me in that context. So, Summarizing all this, uh, I'm more and more convinced that we are at the dawn of a new of new pedagogies in learning environments. Uh, uh, and this is a picture here from uh, Jutteborg's uh, Hafen or, uh, or port. Um, and uh, you know that up here in the north, the dawn takes a long time and the sunset and sunrise. Uh, so it's quite a long term, long term dawn. But um, uh, one thing is that shaping the shift uh, comes with the same challenges that causes the shift actually um, which means that uh, in order to face that kind of you know um, uh, extension of the of the educational landscape we also need to leave our own silo as designers so design won't be enough in that context and um, what that does was could that mean on a more concrete base as designers, we really need to learn how to act and engage within complex and hierarchical systems such as higher education. That is something we are not very well prepared for when I think of most of bachelor's and, and, and master's design programs. It's a lot about, you know, the kind of shaping personal skills, becoming this individual that is uh, able to facilitate complex um, uh, and bottom-up processes and the higher educational system sometimes is pretty much the opposite of bottom-up, right? Uh, secondly, as designers, we need to learn how to cooperate within these structures. Um, we need to gain more and more expertise in pedagogy. Um, while, you know, maybe 30 years back, it was might have been enough being a very good design practitioner in order to learn or teach design. Nowadays, it's not enough anymore. And I see many, many colleagues struggling with new pedagogical approaches being introduced uh, in education. And last but least, we, we need to extend our lifelong learning strategies with those of other fields. So that's why I'm more and more convinced that design won't be enough in that very challenging context. Thank you for your attention, and I'm looking forward to our discussion maybe later on.